Welcome to the Hudson Institute. I'm Brian Clark, a senior fellow at the Institute and director of the Hudson Center for Defense Concepts and Technology. Uh, we are uh, honored today to have a great discussion with a, uh, a panel talking about the future of the microelectronics industry and its semi, uh, semiconductor supply chain. Um, to talk about some of the recent events that we've had surrounding the Chips and Science Act, uh, as well as export controls put in place by the Biden administration uh, in an effort to contain China's ability to uh, import uh, microelectronics technology. So with us today for this uh, discussion are Neil Anderson, who's the strategy lead for the semiconductor business at Kimors, which is a uh, chemical supply company that provides parts to the microelectronics industry. Uh, Rich Shu is here, who is the vice president of global government affairs at LAM Research. Uh, he's also the former assistant secretary of commerce for uh, Bureau, the Bureau of Security and Industry. And also with us is Travis Kelly, uh, who is the president and CEO of the ISOLA Group uh, and the chairman of the Printed Circuit Board Association of America. I want to thank each of the panelists for being here, and I'm looking forward to the discussion uh, on the semiconductor supply chain. So, gentlemen, thank you for being here with us here today. Thank you. Welcome. Great to be with you, Brian. And so, uh, to, to start, start off, uh, review of why we decided to put this event together was, um, you know, over the last six months or so, uh, Congress has passed the Chips and Science Act, which is going to put a lot of money and incentives uh, into the microelectronics industry. Um, that is uh, now starting to spool out in terms of actual spending and, and uh, grants that are going to be issued. The Commerce Department's working on that. Also, the administration uh, recently put in place some export controls that were limiting the access of China to microelectronics uh, uh, equipment, uh, microelectronics uh, pieces themselves, so semiconductor chips, as well as the equipment and uh, technical knowledge necessary to build those chips. So really trying to cut off or, or constrain the Chinese ability to manufacture these most sophisticated microelectronics that are necessary for everything from mobile phones to uh, precision guided weapons. So so the, there's a lot of activity going on in the microelectronic supply chain space um, and one of the concerns that we had, and this has been brought up by some of our recent, recent discussions with uh, members of Congress, is that perhaps the, the investment, uh, the incentives, uh, and the uh, controls that the government's putting in place are not going to really target the parts of the supply chain that are maybe most vulnerable uh, and be mo most challenged. Um, the microelectronic supply chain in the United States is fairly complex. There's thousands of you know, individual companies as well as elements to uh, manufacturing a semiconductor chip. Uh, and then putting that on a circuit board and actually installing it in the system. Um, a lot of those suppliers are not in the United States, and uh, those that are in the United States are often the sole source for those. So um, I want to talk a little bit about that and the health of the semiconductor and microelectronic supply chain with the introduction of these new changes, and then also how does that position the United States for that long-term competition with China? So to, to open it up here, um, I, I wanted to ask each of our panelists um, you know, is the, the federal government's putting a lot of money towards uh, the semiconductor supply chain and the microelectronic supply chain, um, and also putting some incentives in place to try to drive private uh, capital into the supply chain. Um, are those investments and incentives going to the right place? And where do you see the microelectronic supply chain uh, being most vulnerable? Um, and, and we'll start with you, Neil. Thank you for being here. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Um, Brian, I appreciate your time in the Hudson Group and my fellow panelists. So as you said in your intro, I work for Chemours. If you're not familiar with the name, Chemours spun out of DuPont in 2016. We're essentially the fluoropolymer division of DuPont. So we made PFA, uh, a specialty resin uh, that has some really unique properties that are used pretty ubiquitously across the semiconductor infrastructure and semiconductor fabrication facilities. You know, so when I think about the supply chain and the health, um, you know, Brian, I, I look at it from a raw material perspective. So we sit way back deep in the supply chain. We're the only U.S. based and U.S. manufacturer of record for semiconductor PFA. So our product gets sold to a molder or to a converter who does their work to create a subassembly that then goes to another layer that then ultimately ends up in one of Rich's tools uh, or in one of the semiconductor fabs around the world. So, you know, when I think about a single point of failure, um, I, I had an example earlier this year that we became aware of <clears throat> a $35 gasket was holding up an $80 million tool that was holding up the opening of a semiconductor fab that we all then know the name of. So, 
just really illustrated the challenges and how one simple piece like that can create fragility across that supply chain. So when I think about other areas that look similar to that, you know, I think about things like photo resist, right, where 70% of the capacity for photo resist in the world is concentrated in four companies who all have operations in the same part of Japan. So not necessarily a single point of failure, but when you look at it from a geographic perspective, it presents the same amount of risk. Um, you know, another one that comes to mind is ABF, Anjinomoto uh, Buildup Film. This is a specialty material used in the semiconductor buildup in the substrate that they have 70 to 75% market share, depending on how you look at that uh, industry. Um, and then the last place, and really, I think, to get to the heart of your, you know, are we focused in the right areas, but also do we have incentives in the right areas? I look at the packaging side of the business, right? The front end gets a lot of the notoriety, the big names that we all know, but there is not any significant IC packaging and test in North America. 75% of that capacity is all overseas with a large chunk of it in China. Uh, so to me, that's another area that I think has a chance for failure uh, and is something that the government should really look at hard to understand how do they fill that gap. Um, you know, and I'm sure we'll talk in more detail about what portions of the supply chain we think follow that, the OSAT world or the advanced pa or packaging and assembly. I don't see that migrating. And I think that'll just be a function of economics. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, there are market incentives, market factors that drive you know where the industry has evolved and how it's concentrated uh, certain pieces of it in certain regions. Um, so, Rich, I, I wanted to bring you in to, to ask about this as well because now when you talk about the microelectronics supply chain, you know, you kind of go from uh, what Neil and Kimors uh, and companies like that do to provide the raw materials and parts now up to the assemblies or the machines that actually you know, build semiconductors, which is what a lot of what you do is so how do you view the the microelectronic supply chain what are its vulnerabilities and is the government's investment really going to be targeting the right elements of it to, to make it more resilient yeah no thanks brian and, and it's great to be with neil and, and travis as well thanks for doing this event um you know we could we could spend a lot of time talking about one of the most complex supply chains uh, that's ever been i mean uh there, there, i don't think there's another way to say it and neil's Neil's comments uh, are illustrative of the fact that there's fragility all throughout the system, and yet it has worked. Uh, you know, the, the, the system, uh, you know, one of the words I bristle at often during the debates that we've been hearing, certainly in Congress, but elsewhere, is that the U.S. Has, has, quote unquote, lost its lead. And, uh, you know, that only applies uh, in, in very limited circumstances, usually when it comes to kind of volume manufacturing of chips themselves. That is true, that's that's migrated off US shores. It's a legitimate goal to talk about how you change that. But that is a very different thing than, than saying the US has lost its lead. And where the US maintains a lead uh, is in the tool industry, in, in the machines that go into the fabs that make the chips. There is no such thing as an advanced chip that's commercially available that's made without LAM equipment. Uh, and there's only two other companies in the U.S. Uh, that, that, uh, that do what we do and, and really uh, only, only five globally. And, and it's, it's a very small number of companies that integrate uh, these very complex technologies. And uh, that, that does make for a fragile system, but, it, but the system has worked and the U.S. is in the lead. Now, what's happened, as you, as you mentioned, the, the U.S. policymakers uh, have decided to change the system under which that lead was achieved uh, and did so by severely restricting trade aimed at the tool industry and, and, and certainly the, the, the supply chain within that tool industry. Um, you know, whether, whether or not that was uh, a sound uh, way to do it remains to be seen. I think everybody agrees. It's less about the what and more about the how. Um, everyone agrees that, that, that semiconductor leadership is a national security concern. Uh, but if that's the case, we need to ask ourselves seriously uh, about whether or not um, the government is aware that they, they changed the system overnight uh, and there is no clear replacement for it. Someone answer, well, that's the CHIPS Act. And I would, I would reply, um, uh, that's, that's not an answer. Uh, and and I'll, I'll, I'll tell you why. Uh, the way 
uh, businesses spend their investment money is very, very different than the way the government spends investment money. And certainly the government spends investment money on businesses. Uh, the analogy I like to use is, uh, it, you know, for a company like LAM, which, uh, which takes zero federal dollars in, in, you know, any kind of incentive or, or, or grant fund. We don't, we don't do that. We're hundred percent self-funded in our R and D. Uh, that's when we put R and D dollars on a target, it's like a laser. We know exactly where to put it in order to maintain that lead that I think we all agree is so important Wes. When the government spends money, and I can say this coming from, from my years not only working in government, but 25 years in defense and aerospace, uh, I know how the government spends money. It's more like a pachinko game. For those of you who are familiar with, with, with the Japanese game where, where, where things you know, fall, uh, it's almost like an upright, it's upright pinball. It, uh, you know, uh, uh, coins fall down and they bounce around and eventually they get to the destination, uh, but you're not exactly sure where it's going to land and what happens to it along the way. And that's the situation we're in, we're in right now, where there's a great deal of emphasis on changing the way R&D is funded. Uh, and I'm not here to debate the wisdom of it. I am here to suggest that there is a major difference between the two. Conversations like this are gonna be extraordinarily necessary to making sure we get it right going forward. Rich, a great point about um, you know where the government spends money, how it's not really a, a laser beam. It's not. It's not a precision weapon. Uh, it's actually a very long filtered process. Uh, and also, you know, I think you know you, we'll talk later about um, the relative value of these uh, efforts to try to cut China off from the supply chain, and you know what the you know how long that's going to really be able to hold. Um, so I want to turn to Travis now because um, you know it, it, as you go up the up the down the supply chain, if you will. Um, you know, from uh, a manufactured uh, semiconductor integrated circuit chip that gets put into, packaged into a, a uh, some kind of system on a chip, and then it's going to get put into a circuit board and then turned into something that turn, that's going to be put into a piece of equipment. So, Travis, uh, what are you seeing in terms of the supply chain's health? What are its vulnerabilities? And is the Chips and Science Act and the other government efforts that have been you know, undertaken recently, is that really going to help in terms of that? you know, later stage of the microelectronic supply chain? Yeah, so thanks again, Brian, for hosting this event and, and Rich and Neil, um, my fellow panelists. I'm looking forward to, to this discussion. I'm going to bifurcate my answer two different ways. <clears throat> so first and foremost, as president and chief executive officer of Isola Group, we actually make the base material that goes into printed circuit boards. So it's called laminate or prepreg. Ultimately, similar to what Neil was saying about Comores, uh, Isola is the last American-owned full suite provider of laminate. All right, so a single po uh, point of failure. International company, but headquartered in the U.S. with manufacturing facilities in the U.S. And something that Rich said and Neil, when people hear microelectronics, it, it's an umbrella term. But it's actually a very complex ecosystem. Um, you know, speaking as the chairman of the Printed Circuit Board Association of America, chips don't float. So what does that mean? That means you have to embed the chip in some type of IC substrate, advanced packaging, and then embed it onto a printed circuit board. And then ultimately it goes into the final system. That ecosystem of microelectronics is more than just semiconductors, even though that's what really gets the focus today. It is everything from the base material supplier like an Isola to the printed circuit board fabricators and then all the way up to the supply chain. So when you think about single, single points of failures, you can actually peel the onion back even further. There's single point of failures at, in terms of a copper supplier. There's only one uh, copper foil supplier that's left in America and South Carolina. There's only one yarn, fiberglass yarn uh, supplier in South Car Carolina as well. Um, so, and there's only one uh, weaver as well in South Carolina. Um, so when you really start breaking it down and looking at the vulnerabilities, it's significant. And when you think about the printed circuit board um, domestic industry, you know, here's here's an industry and it's somewhat draconian that had roughly 26 percent of the global market share back in the year 2000. That is now down to four percent. The majority of printed circuit boards are now made in Asia. So once again, it's it's not having a myopic view relative to, to hey, everything needs to be onshored, reshored, or French shored. It's what is the critical balance that we need as a nation to ensure that those end segments, and we have to define what those are, obviously defense, aerospace, medical, banking, 
uh, infrastructure like 5G, once we define, hey, these are the critical end segments that we want to have a resilient and secure supply chain for, we need to figure out what that demand signal is because Rich is absolutely correct. It's hard for domestic industry to write an investment thesis on the hope that there'll be an aggregate demand signal. Right. In order for CEOs to actually put R&D dollars in, cap X dollars in, you have to know that there's going to be demand in order to have a sustainable domestic infrastructure. And right now, I think that's where a lot of things are up in the air. I think, you know, we support the Printed Circuit Board Association of America supports the CHIPS Act. I think that's a great start. But if we're really going to address the root cause of the issue, it's really looking at the entire microelectronics ecosystem and figuring out what are those end segments, what type of demand does that, you know, does that create, and then how do you build up a resilient and secure domestic supply chain? So there's a lot of moving pieces that we need to solve for, and some of it is government, but a lot of it's private too. And we all have to work together to really get our voice around. Here's some end segments that we want to make sure there's a secure and resilient supply chain for. And once we get the answer and our voice around that, I think we can all work together to do similar types of legislation like the CHIPS Act to make sure we have a resilient base. Yeah, Travis, uh, that's a great, great point. We just um, one of the uh, reasons we wanted to do this uh, event is because we just released a study here at Hudson looking at how DOD could better employ the commercial microelectronic supply chain for its own purposes, how like 5G and some of the new technologies that are being developed and, and fielded in, in large numbers could really yield a lot of uh, useful um, you know, radio frequency systems on a chip. Um, systems on a chip for other applications, antennas, et cetera, that could be repurposed towards defense purposes. Um, and one of the insights that we kind of gained from that study was the fact that uh, government investment is teeny tiny compared to anything that's being done on the commercial side. So private uh, capital vastly uh, outnumbers the dollars that are coming in from the government in terms of uh, a demand signal. So if you're you're looking at trying to to shore up the microelectronic supply chain, the government's not going to be able to do it as a customer by itself. And really, the, the the government should be thinking of itself more as like a retail customer rather than as a contractor that's that's asking somebody to build something uh, to a specific purpose. So, so to that end, I wanted to ask you, Neil, um, do we think that you know the investment that the government's making, you know, kind of at the far end of the supply chain, so maybe in the fabrication part? Um, and uh, you know maybe in some of the um, you know end products that the government may purchase. So it's it th are those investments going to trickle down? And will you you know for example at Chemors as a very early stage uh, supply chain provider, are you going to see any of that investment turn into a demand signal or the uh, something that might cause you to invest more of your private money in, in infrastructure? Yeah, I, I think so. But to Travis's point, right today we don't have a uniform demand picture. Right. We've had a ton of announcements that have made the news, uh, great photo ops with the uh, majority of senators and, and other dignitaries. But, you know, breaking ground versus facilitating a fab are two very, very different things. Um, so I would like to come back to an area that I think is important, Brian. So when I look at the semiconductor manufacturing piece, I don't know that I would call it trickle down, but perhaps pull through. Uh, so when you look at uh, specialty wet chem, providers, right, who provide all the bulk uh, specialty gases and specialty liquids uh, to the semiconductor companies, I could see them beginning to put brick and mortar, even without government subsidies, right, because within their business, they have to have proximity, they've got to have real-time supply, and those things are used pretty ubiquitously across a fab. These would th be things like HF, sulfuric acid, argon, helium, nitrogen, um, you know, I see those companies following the fabs, right? I mean, that, that looks almost in lockstep to me. However, when I start to think about the companies that are building these fabs today, they don't really have any packaging capability anywhere, whether that be onshore here in the U.S. or even facilities that they own abroad. So I think that's really going to be a pretty glaring gap for the industry. And, you know, I think that's something that the committee should really look long and hard at, because I don't know that there's an easy way to solve it. You know, some of the brick and mortar, you're going to have some economics that aren't going to make sense. So perhaps incentives are needed uh, to, you know, start that initial investment and get it up and running. But, you know, perhaps there's others like these specialty areas we really have to look at and determine, is that something we can make ourselves, right? Or what does a joint venture look like? 
Yeah, that's that's a, a good point. It's, it's a this idea of a pull through, I think, is really mm -hmm. important. Um, and uh, you know, the government can be a customer uh, to a degree, like we talked about in our study. Uh, it's not a big customer, um, so the benefit is mostly to the government from benefiting from you know cutting edge technology. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, it still is a demand signal that can help, um, which brings up uh, you know an idea that I think you know Travis we've talked about before is you know can the government improve the demand signal that comes to, um, for example, the printed circuit board industry by changing policies that you know shift more of that manufacturing to be you know, required to be made in the United States through ITAR restrictions or Buy America are those tools that are useful to try to foster more investment in the United States or um, or do we create incentives that just, like Neil said, make it more economically viable for circuit board type manufacturers to, to onshore? Yeah, so I, I think Neil brings up a lot of good points. And, you know, similar to the CHIPS Act, there was a bill introduced uh, last year, H.R. 7677. The codification will change with the new Congress coming in. But ultimately, it's supporting American-made PCBs. And it's really twofold. One, you have a investment, right, roughly a $3 billion investment, both in R&D and facilitization. And then you have a tax credit. The interesting thing is the tax credit would be at the OEM level. So for every American-made printed circuit board that the OEM acquires, they get a tax benefit off that. So it's creating that pull strategy that you know Neil was referencing earlier. And, and that's the key here. And, and ultimately, you know, the government needs to be the catalyst and the catalyst can be the, the CHIPS Act in, in this uh, of supporting American made PCBs by the initial investment, right? The, the CapEx or the R&D dollars, you know, the investment in STEM, because we don't have a lot of the, the DNA you need in individuals to scale up some of these industries you know, signal integrity engineers and things like that. So I see the government playing a heavy role in the STEM, in the initial uh, CapEx deployment, the allocation of funds to build up an industry. But then, you know, to Neil and Rich's point, in order to have a sustainable industry, you need that consistent demand signal. And you're right. If, if we're all relying on aerospace and defense, we're not going to get there because roughly that's 5% of the overall global market share from a printed circuit board standpoint. No one, no CEO is going to write an investment thesis off such a small amount of volume. And, and I think that's why we're always going to get back to this ultimate argument of what are those critical industries that we want to have a secure and resilient supply chain for? Because if you add up medical banking infrastructure like 5G in, in the future, aerospace and defense, you get to 26% of the global market share in those sectors that you can write an investment thesis for. So when you're thinking about opening up a, a fabrication shop, PCB fab shop, assembly shop, or a base material supplier, you're thinking of you know, a couple hundred million dollars because you're going to have to be relatively automated to level the playing field against some of the competition from other uh, countries that subsidize cost. So you're really looking at investing in the, in the, in the plant of the future with that automation so you can be competitive. So it's real capital dollars that have to go out. So that's why it's more, it can't be just myopic thinking the government's gonna solve this problem. It's gotta be all of us working together. But but you're so what you're pl implying though is that government policy could help because in those other industries you know that bring up the make up that twenty six percent of the the market there could be some opportunities for the government to drive that manufacturing to the United States or to allied countries right because you could make it so that it's required to be you know be done in in some in some territorial you know, limitations That's or exactly you could make right. it ITAR controlled or. That's right, Brian, because you, you would have to. And that's why I think it's so important that, you know, government and industry gets their voice around what are these critical end segments, right? What, what, what can prevent growth from an infrastructure standpoint for the next pandemic or the next policy from a foreign government that says, that, hey, you just can't ship that material, right? So what are those critical end segments in the U.S. that we want to have protected? And I think that is policy. I think the government has to drive that. And then ultimately, that will drive the right demand signals for certain domestic um, companies to invest. So Rich, you've uh, done this job before. <laughs> you've, you've been right here in these trenches. Um, so a question um, you know that, that I had uh, based on what Travis and Neil have talked about is it seems like they're talking about you know this idea of a pull through strategy or mm -hmm. or demand or essentially demand based tools to try to change the demand signal to increase either the demand uh, for these you know for the parts of the supply chain in general but more more specifically to increase demand for uh, ma manufacturing in the United States so 
policies that drive manufacturing toward the United States from a demand side? Because it seems like the administration is kind of looking at mostly supply side tools, both in terms of the investment of the Chips and Science Act, but also the export controls. Those are a supply you know, side tool as well. Do, do you think we should be looking more demand side tools like that? Or, or what's your perspective as, a, as someone who's been doing this job before? Yeah, so I, I think there's a, you're, you're probably detecting a theme here, which is it's very difficult to pick one line of effort. Uh, in fact, mo more important is to make sure that your lines of effort don't uh, don't conflict or cross. Uh, and I think that is a bit of where we are, where we are today, where uh, we've got a bit of a, a maelstrom of public policy that is, um, that, that really is need of a, of a larger strategy. So, you know, you, we've got, you know, we're, we're going between really three things, export controls, which are national security or should be. Uh, we've got uh, industrial policy in the form of the CHIPS Act, which, which can have a, have a multiplier effect if, if, if um, applied properly and then and then there's there's supply chain security which is sort of a um it's more of a resilience issue and it touches on both but it's it's but it's also neither and so you know the 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 idea that this um these challenges can be met in the context of one bill one initiative one government uh is 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 really is really uh, difficult to grasp i would say what the government does quite well it, it actually does do national security quite well it, it's entitled to it and it and it has to but you know national security is about saying no and innovation and economic growth that's about saying go for it it's about saying take taking handcuffs off it's it's a they're, they're two extraordinarily different things and when you look at the history since we're talking about semiconductors you know, the U.S. semiconductor lead really exploded when the government kind of stepped away. Uh, as a young executive, uh, you know, for a defense company, uh, you know, 30 years ago, I remember we were trying to make chips for very specific defense applications. And and sometimes that's absolutely necessary, but it's it's no way to run a business uh, either. It's not, you're not going to be able to sell those chips. It used to be rad hard, was very, 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 very unique. And and uh, and hard to do, and when the government needs it, you do it. But but I'll tell you something. What happened in the along the way? That the company that I worked for held the original patent for video games. It was Pong, right? They held that original patent. And now video games are what's driving the 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 advancement in chips. Uh, it's it's gaming. The, the most powerful chips available on the market are to do gaming. So what that's told told you is. The government funding of of chip development is is three decades ago. It's not now. What it, it, there's no way it can compete compete with the volumes of dollars that are getting put that are commercially driven. I, again, we we have to ask ourselves if we want a different system. What how are we going to replace that? It's not going to be with government money because there just isn't enough. So that's that is that is the challenge, and I and 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 you know the, the, today where we stand, my my one mantra is first do no harm. We, again, we we are in a position where we actually do have strength in many many I'd say most areas of the ecosystem. That's really important to not allow that to perish. Yeah, good point. And uh, you know, since there are U.S. strengths in things like you know tooling, uh, design. Uh, the, and then final marketing and integration. Um, you know, you want to enhance those advantages while figuring out what you need to shore up in the other parts of the supply chain. You know, clearly. So, so a question on 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 that is um, the you know since private investment is so much larger than any of the government investment, and private investment is really necessary to continue to keep microelectronics at the cutting edge, um, which the government you know should benefit more from. Um, how does the government incentivize you know more investment in the U.S. microelectronics supply chain? So, for example, LAM is one of the companies that is in the sector that we have a strength in and an advantage in. So, you want to encourage LAM to continue to build on that advantage. Um, the export controls seem like they're almost discouraging investment because that's taking away you know a potential set of customers that you would have designed to support you know, to, you know, to provide a demand signal, or it's a demand signal that you would be working against. Is, are the export controls gonna you know, reduce the incentive for manufacturers to build up their plant and, and expand their operations? Yeah, so what, what 
the export controls necessarily won't do that. What the export controls do is, uh, is again, dramatically change how companies like LAM fund their operations. And uh, I think it's worth noting, LAM, um, we are a US company. We do all our manufacturing in the US. We do no R&D in China. We sell into Asia uh, and we're partnered with very important. I mean, well, obviously we're partnered with the Koreans and Japanese and Taiwanese, et cetera. So when you look at how we're behaving right now, I'm, I struggle to say what, what is the problem? Um, we're doing the things that 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 most most policymakers say they want to they want to see done, and and the incentives uh, were were fine for for us. But as we all know, you know the global you know global tensions with China. Um, I was not only very familiar with them, but I implemented first restrictions on not only the Uyghurs, but on a on a Chinese fab. So I I you know this is something you you. It's not static, yeah, and and I fully respect those who are struggling with these issues. Um, but keep in mind, export controls. The 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 uh, analogy I use it's sort of like the James Bond car, where he's trying to get away from the bad guys. The export controls are all the bag of tricks in the trunk. It will, you know, the oil slick and the tax that it'll slow them down. But you know, the bad guys never stop coming. They keep coming, but they keep them behind. What allows the getaway is that foot on the accelerator, which again, that is what the US does absolutely best. It's that innovation. We're still the most innovative country in the world. And we just changed through the October 7 rule, the way companies innovate in the space. We, a big, China used to pay US companies to be ahead of them. And, and that's changing. It's not, it's not completely changed, but it's, it's changing. And, and if we lose our innovation grasp, um, then, then we really, that, then we have a Yeah, yeah, Rich. Uh, and then and one of the findings from our study was that DOD really could apply commercial microelectronics in a lot more applications um, as they move towards a larger, more distributed force with a lot more cheap uh, unmanned systems. Um, and if you're not incentivizing U.S. companies to invest in that next generation of technology, well, then you're not going to benefit from being at the cutting edge. Yeah, and Brian, uh, before, you yeah. know, just, to, you know, so, so I mentioned that, you know, LAM does no work with the U.S. government. We certainly don't do any with DOD. We'd be happy to. Uh, it's hard, though. It's very hard for, for a very right. nimble, very innovative, you know, commercially driven company. Right. Um, it, you know, it's why you have pure play defense companies in pure play. Right. You know, uh, that's that's a good conversation to have. It's how we can make right. it easier to work together. Yeah, absolutely. And I, and one of the things we found was that because of that difficulty of working with DoD, you do end up with uh, microelectronics being built by pure play defense companies, Northrop Grumman, um, a couple others, Global Foundries support them. You know, so there's there are some limited you know companies that are able to work the DoD system. <laughs> they they can yeah. they they built themselves around that. Um, but really, it's increasingly becoming the case that. Uh, those microelectronics, there's a few bespoke purposes that they have to be applied to, but uh, you know, a much larger proportion of DoD microelectronics needs could be supplied by just pure play commercial providers uh, if the DoD was willing to think about its requirements differently. So instead of you know defining requirements in isolation and then saying I need this custom built part, I instead I'm going to look what the the parts bin has available for me and then adapt my requirements to meet the capabilities that are available on the commercial market. Um, which is what any company would do, right? You, most companies don't have the wherewithal to go build their own chips uh, like Apple does. Um, right. So they have to use what they got. Um, so Neil, you know, one, one thing that this sort of uh, raises to me is the, is the question of um, if we want to uh, improve the you know, capacity and the resilience of the U.S. microelectronic supply chain, you know, we talked about packaging as being a glaring kind of hole in that. Um, when it comes to the you know early stage pieces of the supply chain, um, how do how does that investment you know does the U.S. need to incentivize um, those companies to build manufacturing plants in the United States, or or can that be in allied countries? Can we you know look at other countries you know that are friendly to be you know the source of those manuf those parts and and supplies and chemicals, um, or does this or, or is this just something that you know tends to be co-located with the manufacturing facility? How, how, how should the U.S. be looking at those early stage kind of precursor components of the microelectronic supply chain? Yeah, and, and that's a great question. And I think you really have to ask yourself, what are they trying to solve, right? So if I look at, um, you know, let's take ABF, for example, that I know Travis is familiar with. Um, so NGMoto 
buildup film is what the ABF stand for. So Japanese company, 70 plus percent market share. You know, if we truly want secure supply, you know, we could solve that a couple of different ways, right? We could ask them or incentivize them to open a facility in the U.S. that manufactures to support, you know, the 14 fabs that were just announced here, right? Um, you know, or do we want to incentivize them or, or penalize them for not having that, right? And put them at a disadvantage to then create, I think what Rich is more talking about is more the commercial market opportunity, right? Where you get private investment that says, hey, here's an opportunity. Now they have an artificially inflated price. My market opportunity is now bigger and I can justify the investment. Um, so I really think it depends on, on what is the problem you're trying to solve and how heavy handed do you want to be with it? <clears throat> um, and, and Brian, I don't know if we're going to talk more about allied countries, uh, but Japan plays a really critical role in a variety of the material and chemical companies. Um, you know, the, the other, uh, you know, the other area outside of photo resist, which today pretty significant, um, you know, you've got all of our PFA competitors are there as well. So when you look at the points of failure, Japan plays a pretty key role there. Yeah, and and uh, one of the things I wanted to ask you about on that deal is um, Japan. Um, yeah, you know, obviously is a friendly country. Then I'd say it's, it's unlikely they're going to cut us off, but they could be cut off if there is a confrontation in the Western Pacific, even if it's not, you know, a war per se. But there could be a situation where you know maritime traffic is impeded because China decides to you know blockade or quarantine countries, right. you know, in some kind of you know, periodic fashion. So you could see a situation where shipping between the United States and Japan becomes less dependable and, and less uh, regular. Um, and we need to think about, you know, what, how big, how is that going to impact this, you know, increased fabrication capacity in the United States as it suddenly left waiting for material and parts to arrive. Um, so, so the government may want to onshore more of that capacity. Um, but I think you bring up a good point that there's ways to do that with, with carrots and with sticks. So in Kimor's case, you know, do, do you um, do you think that that's the? Uh, would you prefer which which of those two approaches do you think you would prefer <laughs> if you were looking to expand your your you know production into new chemical you know uh, fields or new chemical uh, precursors? I'll give you my witty answer then my real answer. So if they approve our proposal for Chips Act, problem solved. We'll satisfy all the demand. <laughs> <laughs> now the more practical answer is, um, you know, I'm a free market capitalist. I'd love to see it handled in the capitalist environment and the best supplier win. Um, you know, however, you know, I think the challenge today that we face is from the time we decide financially what we want to create a facility, the permitting and then the build out can be as long as three to three and a half years. So it, it's really a long play, right? You know, these are not plants that you build in six to nine months. Um, so I, I think, Practically speaking, no matter what direction the U.S. government takes, there's going to be a pretty significant runway to get that capacity up and running, qualified, uh, and then ultimately through the value chain into a fab. So, th which uh, I think you know, now as we move into you know a discussion about how do we uh, address the the challenges of the current microelectronic supply chain, I, I think one thing um, you know we should you know talk about is this idea of um, Increasing investment in overseas, you know, suppliers. Um, so, so Travis, I, you know, they, uh, you know, you mentioned that only a very small percentage of uh, printed circuit boards are, are manufactured in the United States. Um, would there be? Uh, is it would be? It would be acceptable to just diversify that production to other friendly countries, or do we want to bring more of it to the U.S.? Is there a, is there an advantage to having it in the U.S.? Um, relative to having it in a friendly country overseas? Yeah, that, that's a great question. And no, no matter how I answer, it's going to be wrong. <laughs> so <laughs> someone will play this back a year from now. I mean, look, you know, ultimately, you know, Europe, you know, countries like Germany and friendly, you, you don't want to be myopic, right? I think what happened is everyone over indexed and said, we need cheaper production. And not only did we offshore brick and mortar, but we offshored all the technological know-how. And then you have something called COVID-19 happen. You have different quarantines happening. Ports are being shut down. You have slow steaming. So now we're looking at it saying, well, wait a second. You know, are there certain end segments that we should have this secure and resilient supply chain for? And now you don't also want to over-index the other way. 
right? You you can't bring everything back to the U.S. because that's too much of a myopic view. It's a global economy. The reason I said no matter how I answer, and I'm not trying to dance around it, is I, I would have made an argument six months ago, you know, look at Mexico, look at Canada, look at countries in Europe like Germany. Fast forward, you know, and with the war in Ukraine, now you have an energy crisis, definitely in Germany and pretty much the broader Europe, plus, you know, a hyperinflation. That's why. So so you want to make sure that you have flexibility and not over indexing one way or the other. So it's not binary. It's not yes or no. It's, you know, do you want to have a geographical footprint, both in terms of having something in the United States, maybe something in Mexico, Canada and certain other European countries? I think if you're going to over index and just say, hey, right now it's safe in this country. Who knows what's going to happen in a couple of years? And I think that's where we lost a lot of our, our competitive edge is, is being too uh, inflexible, if you will, and not really looking at how do you diversify or what I say, de-risk, you know, certain activities that are actually, you know, absolutely critical to our success. And I, I, I agree, excuse me, <clears throat> I agree with what Neil said, and I say this a lot in my meetings, what problem are we trying to solve? Right. Because we I think we have a problem defining problem statements. And, and if it's really to create, you know, a secure and resilient supply chain, then what are the different pieces on the chessboard that we can move around? But if you just arbitrarily pick, OK, well, Taiwan's at risk. You know, um, there could be a blockade around Taiwan. It could impact Japan. Move everything to Malaysia or move everything to Thailand or move everything to Germany. You're going to be wrong regardless. Because right? no one could have anticipated a year ago that we would have a potential energy crisis, uh, especially in Germany. And I'm not just referring to prices, but I'm also referring to the overall usage. Right? We may not have enough energy. Um, so we, we, you, you have to make sure that you have contingency plans in everything we do. And that's why I think it's yeah. not you know, government, it's not private, it's all of us figuring this out. Yeah, if I could yeah, add yeah. to that. Yep, Ryan, I, I think Travis makes a really good point, right? And, and looking at it from a BCP and risk mitigation strategy rather than a where is my brick and mortar, right? Because if we're really trying to solve the corner case of if something were to happen in a certain part of the country or in a certain part of the world that impacted this company, what would we do, right? And rather than trying to plan for those infinite number of scenarios, if you get some redundancy to that supply chain, and both geographically and ideally company-wise, you know, I, I think that's another way to solve this issue. Yeah, and so, uh, Rich, this this is uh, coming back to you and your expertise in the Commerce Department. Uh, when um, when we think about trying to diversify supply chains to improve resiliency, um, you know, this is not necessarily as much about, you know, improving, you know, the U.S. position relative to another country, but it's about making our supply chain more, more, uh, more, more resilient, less vulnerable. Um, how do we incentivize diversification? Because diversification seems like it naturally, you know, is going to um, create some additional cost. You know, it's not necessarily as efficient, especially if you've got certain countries that are willing to put a lot of money and uh, incentives towards uh, a national champion. Uh, within their industry, how, how do we incentivize uh, diversification? You know, among key parts of the supply chain, like packaging, where you know we've got no U.S. providers essentially. Yeah, yeah. So, to I, you know, to take it out of the esoteric and get and get pretty realistic, the biggest needle movers for companies in in dollars and cents terms are taxes, uh, and and uh, which is why it was somewhat terrifying to you know. Uh, you know, 2017 tax reform, many, many companies, uh, um, you know, were able to leverage those dollars right in advance of COVID to make the kind of investments that ended up paying off quite well for the, for the United States. Uh, you know, it was a tough time for everybody, but we were a whole lot worse. Uh, and, and, and that goes back to the, you know, first do no harm. You know, again, it's, it's sort of, it's sort of like uh, uh, industry with some guidance, which the government also does well. I think they do guidance better than they do uh, traffic control, uh, but with some guidance and 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 uh, a, a, a you know a, a light touch, uh, uh, industry will 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 meet those will meet those goals. We started out, um, uh, I want to say probably about two years ago, at the beginning of this administration, where the messaging was um, any. Uh, job that's created that not in the U.S. is bad. 
And, uh, you know, that's just unrealistic for companies like ours who have to meet global demands. That means you're going to have to have a, a global footprint. And, and we were very, very gratified to see that, again, it, it, it was acknowledged that there was a shift. Uh, which we, we saw when President Biden visited Korea and basically said the U.S. needs countries like South Korea to be with us on advanced technology, and and we were happy to hear that because we had already made investments that that made that true. But that was a really important shift. Um, uh, you know, so so what's what's the policy that would incentivize companies to make more investments that create that resiliency? Again, it's really right now. It's more do no harm. It really is. It's uh, uh, the 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 global demand uh, in uh, for microelectronics is going to require flexibility in funding. Uh, and again, I think the the value of the Chips Act is not the actual dollars, although those will be meaningful. I'm sure there will be some meaningful, but it's really the acknowledgement that the government wants to see companies invest. And that's that's more than guidance. That's 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 downright encouragement, and and, and that is what we need more of. That's that's a great point. That's a, that's a strong signal. Uh, and so the and so then the last question here, I want to address uh, China. You know, because um, a lot of the recent actions are designed around uh, improving our position relative to China when it comes to microelectronics. Um, it seems like if um, you know, as you, as we discussed, you know, there's a a global uh, demand signal. There's also global footprint for manufacturing. Um, should we be thinking about this, you know, as a as a group, for example? Should we be thinking about this as the U.S. and like-minded countries, you know, non-authoritarian countries, you know, kind of banding together to both look at their supply and demand sides to see if they can, you know, make it so that their ecosystem is less dependent upon China. Um, and more you know, resilient uh, in terms of diversified production within their own countries. Is that a way of viewing this? Is Because if you look at it from just the U.S. lens, it gets really complicated, as we've discussed. But if you look at this instead as the lens of like the U.S. and its allied countries, that seems like that's a coalition of both customers and providers that you know, may be relatively um, you know, self-contained, I guess, if you will. Is that, is that one way of viewing it, Rich? Oh, yeah. There's no... It's probably the most important point that should be taken away from this conversation um, uh, for a couple of reasons. One is if if we if you if you're going to implement export controls, they absolutely have to be multilateral. The U.S. has a lead in many ways, but that lead is not exclusive. And we just heard discussion of Japan, which was not included in in any form or fashion in the recent U.S. export control rules. And export controls are multilateral. They're, they're implemented via regimes that are essentially treaties with other countries. In this case, that wasn't, it was, it was set aside, in fact, which I consider to be truly troubling. And, and, and there are public statements coming out of the administration about how they're working to get the Japanese and the Dutch. They also need to talk to the Koreans. This is a global ecosystem, and you can't just limit the U.S. So that that is incredibly important. But if you're trying to put leverage, pressure, encouragement on China, far better to do that as a, as, a, as, a, as a regional, global, philosophical community uh, than go it alone. Uh, go it alone, it's too easy to departmentalize what the U.S. is doing, whereas right. no one likes to be ganged up on. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and so, Neil, that, you know, uh, you know thinking about Japan's uh, role in the chemical and kind of the, your part of the supply chain, uh, it seems like there's definitely opportunities to view this as you know, a coalition approach, you know, do we have within the, you know, the demand coalition, the supply coalition, uh, all the providers for the the pieces that, you know, would make for a resilient supply chain? Is that, do you have those discussions with those companies? Are there opportunities for co-development? Um, how, do, how do you view that? Yeah, so today, Brian, we don't have those conversations, but there's no reason we couldn't. Mm -hmm. You know, we've got relationships across the chemical supply chain, a couple of the ones that I just shared with you. Um, you know, but, but I, I agree with Rich, and, and I just want to add a little bit more color to what he pointed out, right? When you think about Japan, Japan 25, 30, well, actually closer to 30 years ago, was rivaling the U.S. in the semiconductor industry, right? And they missed the innovation boat, right? They became complacent. Now, there are very few tier one fabs anywhere in Japan, but they've re-entrenched in these chemical companies, these materials supplying, and then these specialty companies. Um, 
So I think, you know, there is a lesson to be taken from that when you think about what our actions should be towards China. If it's pretty too, if, if it's bilateral, where it's the U.S. putting sanctions on China and thou shalt, we're going to drive innovation in China and we're going to have an unintended consequence that 10 to 12 years from now, we'll be dealing with it, right? And then they'll come back towards our markets and say, hmm, so you said we couldn't, <laughs> you couldn't sell your equipment to us. Now we're not going to sell our equipment to you. Uh, right. So I think we need to be a bit careful there. And, but I, I do just getting back to your original onset of question, I think a regional like-minded coalition is absolutely the way to go because not only can they not create the world's most advanced semiconductor fabs without the tooling that Rich and his partner companies supply, you can't do it without the semiconductor materials from Japan. So I think Japan would even have more leverage, certainly outside of the equipment business, uh, than maybe any other country. So I think that's a, that's a key linchpin in this negotiation. I, you know, and Travis, um, to round it out, the uh, you know you said most uh, printed circuit boards are, are built or made in in uh, Asia. Um, do you think like this uh, sort of you know coalition of the willing approach, if you will, on the demand side, uh, and then also on the supply side, could kind of give give us the ability to uh, improve the resilience of the of the supply chain uh, up to that perspective, you know, maybe in concert with some, you know, sorts of uh, tools to make the demand signal for U.S. manufacturing larger, like ITAR. Um, do you think that there's there's opportunities there, or is this or is China a huge player in PCB uh, manufacturing? Therefore, we're we're kind of stuck. Yeah, I, I mean, China is a huge player, um, but I do agree with the other comments from the panelists. I mean, ultimately there will be some type of regionalization of the supply chain and you'll see different coalitions being formed. I mean, ultimately there will be unintended consequences because when you do cut off certain countries uh, like China, you're, that is the catalyst for innovation, right? They're not, they're, they're going to have to innovate and, and, and there will be unintended consequences. So I think ultimately if, if you're a country today and you're not asking, what do I have to do to secure up my, my supply chain, then you're being foolish. And I think certain regions and trading partners you will have to band together. I mean, we're, we're making it sound relatively simple and it's not. I mean, even if you look at the way you process certain material like rhodium, right? That, that's a precious metal used in catalytic converters. It's also used in producing uh, yarn, uh, fiberglass yarn for laminate that goes into printed circuit boards that semiconductors need. I can go on and on about the different companies and the entire value chain but the, you know this goes all the way down to precious metals. Um, so it, it, it's going to continue to be a global economy. I know, I, you know I'm beating a dead horse with this, but you know you ask the question, well, you know, is it onshoring, nearshoring, friendshoring? It's going to be all of the above. And that's why I think I'll go back to the beginning. It's critical that we agree and get our voice around what are those critical end segments? Because you may make an argument and I would be a proponent of it saying, hey, these certain end segments need to be produced in the United States. Right. The aerospace and defense. Right. That, that is definitely one of them. You know, infrastructure, 5G in, in the future, low Earth orbit satellites or certain industries. I think you would say, you know what, we want a domestic supply chain as far back in the supply chain as we can go. Obviously, if they're precious metals, not if it's not in, indigenous to the U.S. And obviously you're going to have to go overseas. But this is such a complex ecosystem all the way down to the raw material. You know, the drill bits, the drill bits, uh, the drill bit heads to produce printed circuit boards, everything that's involved. You know, someone really needs to sit down or we need to sit down and get our voice around all this. Yeah, that's a that's a great point. I mean, and I think one takeaway for me is that we should be thinking uh, alongside these supply side tools that we've tended to focus on over the last couple of years, start thinking a lot more about how we can adjust the demand side to start incentivizing and pull through, as you said, uh, you and Neil said that the investment. Uh, so thank you very much, uh, gentlemen. Uh, thanks, Travis Kelly uh, from uh, Isola Group and the uh, Printed Circuit Board Association of America, Rich Ashu from LAM uh, Research, uh, and Neil Anderson from Kim Wars. I re re really appreciate you being here today um, and talking with us about the microelectronic supply chain. Um, I'd also like to thank um, our, uh, our producer, uh, Morgan DeWitt, and uh, Ray Jones, who is uh, engineering this uh, particular uh, episode. And uh, thank you all for being here today from the Hudson Institute. Have a terrific day.